Good evening. In California, a judge ordered the release of half of the inmates inside of a county's jail system due to the virus. But the local sheriff there will not comply, saying that he is not about to release murderers and child molesters back into the community. Now, over in Nevada, the Court of Appeals ruled in favor of religious freedom and struck down rules which limited church attendance. Over in Pennsylvania, a Republican group is once again asking the Supreme Court to take up their case regarding unconstitutional changes that were made to Pennsylvania's mail-in voting laws. And a new report that was just released yesterday shows that over the past 12 years, on average, any county which adopted the Dominion Voting Systems machines moved two to three percentage points towards Democratic presidential candidates. Let's go through these stories together. This is your 2020 election update, and I'm your host, Roman from the Epic Times. Now, the Electoral College has officially met in all 50 states and cast their votes. Joe Biden has officially received 306 votes, while President Trump received 232. However, an alternate slate of Republican electors in seven states, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Michigan, Wisconsin, Arizona, Nevada, and New Mexico, cast their votes for President Trump. Now, this situation is known as having dueling electors. And the last time that we saw this in America was in 1960 during the race between Nixon and JFK. However, that was only in one state, in Hawaii. Now we have these dueling electors in seven states. So what does this all exactly mean? Well, the reason that these alternate electors cast their votes is because it allows them to keep legal challenges open for President Trump up until January 20th. The White House suggested that President Trump will not be conceding anytime soon, saying that he is still involved in ongoing lawsuits challenging the election. Now, if these alternate electors did not cast their votes, the issue might have already been over and done with. But because here in America, when we vote on our ballots, we're not actually voting for presidential candidates, but instead we're voting for a slate of electors to be sent to the Electoral College. So these two groups of electors, these dueling groups, the Republican and Democrats, must now battle it out in the courts to decide which one of them is legitimate. Now, by the way, I just want to take a moment and mention something right here. Right now, if you turn on the TV, you will hear pundits saying that President Trump has already had 50 lawsuits that have been thrown out of court. So obviously there is no election fraud. But the fact is that for one, most of these lawsuits were actually brought forth not by President Trump, but by other groups like local Republican parties or the electors themselves. And secondly, most of them were thrown out of court or rejected due to legal technicalities. For instance, let's talk about what is happening right now in Pennsylvania. Yesterday, a group of Republicans asked the U.S. Supreme Court again to take up their lawsuit, which challenges the 2020 election results. Now, if you remember, the U.S. Supreme Court about a week ago rejected the group's first request to block Pennsylvania from certifying their election results. However, in that earlier case, the plaintiffs were not asking the court to review their lawsuit. They were only asking for something called an immediate injunction relief. Basically, they wanted to have the whole certification process stopped, which they were denied. However, this denial did not mean that the case lacked merit. It was more of a technicality on the part of the Supreme Court. But this time, the plaintiffs in Pennsylvania are filing a complete formal petition to ask the Supreme Court to actually review their lawsuit, to take a look at the merits of the case. Now, in case you don't remember, their lawsuit argues that Pennsylvania's Act 77, which allowed basically anyone to vote by mail without any excuse, was in violation of Pennsylvania's constitution. If you want a refresher on the specifics of Act 77, we discussed that in an earlier episode, and I'll throw the link up here in the top right corner for you to check out. And so now we'll just have to wait and see whether the U.S. Supreme Court will actually take up this new case or what excuse they give to not take it up. If you want to read the details of their petition, I'll throw that link in the description box below this video for you to check out. And while you're down there, take a moment to smash that like button. As you already know, the media in this country are not giving any weight to these credible allegations of voter fraud across so many different states. But on this program, we examine them one by one. These episodes sometimes take many, many hours to make, sometimes the culmination of many man hours across many weeks. And so when you hit that like button that's below this video, you are forcing the YouTube algorithm to share this video out to potentially thousands of more people, letting the truth be known far and wide. Now let's move over to California. In a pretty shocking move, even for California standards, last Friday, a judge ordered the release of 50% of the inmates in Orange County in order to slow down the transmission of COVID-19. That would be over 1,800 inmates that would be released. However, the local sheriff there is refusing to comply with the judge's order, saying that many of these inmates are in pretrial status for or have been convicted of violent crimes and will be released back into the community. What violent crimes? Well, he said that among the inmates to be released are 90 who are in custody for murder or attempted murder, and 94 of them are in for child molestation. 
This sheriff further said that he has no intention of releasing any of these individuals from his custody. He said that he will now be filing an appeal and fighting this county judge line by line and inmate name by name. Now, this whole affair actually started with a case that was brought forth by the ACLU on behalf of the inmates who were in jail, who said that being in jail is detrimental to their health. If you want to read the details of that case, including the ACLU's rationale, I'll throw those links into the description box below this video for you to check out for yourself. Now, let's move on over to Nevada. In a victory for religious freedom, yesterday, the 9th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals ruled in favor of two churches in Nevada, saying that the state's restrictions on church attendance were unconstitutional. Basically, the crux of that case was that the Nevada governor arbitrarily ordered tougher restrictions on religious places of worship compared to, for instance, businesses in the state. For instance, no matter how large a church was, the cap was set to 50 worshipers max. Now, in their 11-page ruling, which I have right here, the court wrote that even in a pandemic, the Constitution cannot be put away and forgotten. The restrictions at issue here, by effectively barring many from attending religious services, strike at the very heart of the First Amendment's guarantee of religious liberty. Now, the governor of Nevada, who is a Democrat, said that he is going to comply with this order, meaning that he likely will not appeal this decision to the U.S. Supreme Court. And in my opinion, that is a bit of a shame, since if he did appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, that might have actually given us some national clarity on religious freedom, right? This, is, this case is only relevant to Nevada. However, the U.S. Supreme Court would rule across the entire nation. Regardless, if you'd like to read the full text of this court's decision and maybe print it out and post it all over your local church, you'll find the link in the description box below this video. Now, let's talk about this report that was released yesterday. Now, I briefly discussed this analysis in yesterday's episode. Basically, a fraud analyst who makes a living developing fraud detection algorithms went county by county throughout the United States, and he compared counties that adopted the Dominion voting machine systems versus ones that did not. And he found that once you account for changes in county population, as well as shifts in demographics, counties that adopted Dominion voting machines, on average, moved two to three percentage points towards Democratic presidential candidates compared to counties that did not adopt these machines. So how did he conduct his research? Well, he went all the way back to 2008. And the reason he chose 2008 was because at that time, only New York State had widely adopted the Dominion voting machines. And what he did was that he basically excluded New York from his analysis, which left him with 657 counties which adopted the Dominion voting machines and 2,388 counties that did not. And that was up to this year, which is 2020. And this is what he found. Even after you control for almost any conceivable variable, such as differences in county population, the number of votes cast, the split between urban and rural populations, population growth, the rate of international immigrants moving in, low education population, manufacturing dependency, and so on, when a county adopted the Dominion voting machines, they had an associated 1.55 percentage point decrease in the Republican vote and a 1.55% increase in the Democrat vote in presidential races. Now, at this point, when he found this out, he wanted to verify and further scrutinize his own claims. And so what he did is that he added seven more control factors to his analysis, including race, voter preference, and age. And when he did that, not only did this dominion effect, which he called, continue, but the probability of his results just being a fluke, they actually decreased. And his conclusion was that there was about a 2.84 percent point shift towards Democrats with the adoption of Dominion voting machines. And he said that the probability of these things occurring by chance was about one in 1,000. Now, we here at the Epic Times, we actually went through the same data and tried to replicate his initial analysis, and we arrived at the exact same result. We reached out to Dominion for comment, but I've yet to hear back. Now, if you'd like to read this full analysis yourself, I'll throw that link in the description box below this video for you to check out. Now, lastly, I want to mention something very cool. We recently filmed a short but very sweet commercial that I'd love for you to see. Take a look. Back in the 50s and 60s, you watched the nightly news. Homes and places of business may need repair. You assumed that because it was on television that it was accurate, truthful, and for the betterment of the people that were watching it. The manager will rotate groups from the main shelter. But you go back and you look at broadcasts from the 70s or 80s or 90s. Here's a story you may not believe. If you look at an entire broadcast uh, cycle, you'll definitely see it. It's just clear as day. The media, whether it's broadcast cable or print media, has become extremely biased. As I became more and more disenchanted, I started looking online for alternative ways to, to get information. And uh, I saw an ad for a free trial. 
And I, I looked at it and I said, Epoch Times? I mean, come on, this is end of days type of stuff. I mean, what are they gonna be talking about here? And I said, well, it's a free trial, let me dig in. Is it giving me both sides? Is it giving me an objective point of view here? I have looked for opportunities to see where they might be biased, and I don't find it. It has given me a level of trust in media that I didn't think I'd ever get back. I love the Epic Times because it has renewed uh, my faith in the idea that a reliable, responsible, non-biased source of information is available. And I can say that I love it because of that. Lastly, if you haven't already, smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel to get this honest reporting delivered directly into your YouTube feed. Subscribe to us on Parler, Instagram, and subscribe to our email newsletter in case YouTube tries to get cute and kick us off their platform. And lastly, until next time, I'm your host, Roman from the Epic Times. Stay informed and stay free.